Follow the Swedish National Geographic explorer Martin Estrom as he embarks on an expedition to the world's largest cave, Song Dong in Vietnam. His mission? To capture the immense cave in an interactive 360 reportage. Follow him in this three-part web series from planning the trip to the depths of Song Dong. I remember the time when I decided to become a photographer. I had inherited my grandfather's camera and uh, I was working as a paper boy to pay for uh, buying rolls of film and I started taking pictures like that and during a vacation in Thailand uh, was the first real moment where I where I realized the power of photography and decided that this is something I want to do when I was able to take a portrait of a young girl on a riverboat that was the first time I really worked up the courage got a really nice portrait of a person and it turned out really stunning when I got to develop photos back. So during high school I started saving up even more money to buy my first digital system camera. I bought that one, started taking images for a few agencies and even started my own company in Sweden to be able to freelance as a photographer full time. And since then I've moved on and this is what I do. Photography is what I do full time. And I've, now I'm working for international publications and organizations like the UN and International Rescue Committee. Working as a reporter or photographer in the field it can be very frustrating when you want to convey the feeling uh, of the issue or the story you're working on to the readers back home. Because no matter how well you can tell a story in text or how well you can photograph still photographs or shoot video, it's really hard to convey that feeling of being there and exploring and seeing a place uh, as the reporter and photographer can do. Because when I'm in the field, uh, be it in a refugee camp, be it in a war zone or a non-conflict zone, wherever I am, I as a reporter and photographer can walk around. I can look around, choose who to talk to and experience the story for myself. And that's basically what we want readers to do. But when we take this amount of input, all of our experiences in the field and try to make a small output in forms of an article or a, a series of still photographs, that's really, really hard to convey that feeling of being there. And I think with all the traditional media, with the, um, all the articles and the still photography we've done, we can't really match the experience of actually being there, seeing the story firsthand. And that's a problem that we really, really have to solve to be able to tell sto important stories to people back home. So that's why I work with a new format, an interactive type of reportage, where we try to put the reader inside the story. Uh, this works with, uh, in my case, that we take images in 360 degrees, which means we photograph the whole scene instead of just taking a still image or a video shot of one specific direction. We take the whole scene and create an almost game-like experience where you can walk around inside the story, explore the location, explore the people, choose who to talk to, and become an active part of the story. So you ba you're basically able to act as a reader. You can walk around like a reporter or uh, the person driving the story forward. And this is really important because this adds the fact that people get to explore for themselves and people become active parts of the story. And this is very different from traditional journalism where you just read a text or watch a movie. In this case, you can actually walk around as if you were there. And that's, that, I think that makes all the difference in being able to understand complex issues and seeing it for yourself. And since I started working with this kind of interactive stories, I noted, noticed a really big difference in how people interact with the story because it, it really works. They can walk around inside these reportages and decide for themselves how to in interact with the story. They can hear the sounds from standing in a refugee camp, for example. They can walk into people's houses. They can choose where to go and what to see. And it really works. It works especially well on the young generation that have grown up with computer games. They, can, they have a native understanding of how to explore a reportage like this, which is very different from just reading a text from point A to point B. And I, I know for sure that uh, these people who take part in my interactive reportages, walking around inside these stories, uh, they would probably never have read a text about the same story. So it really gives a new way to reach many new audiences about really important issues that it probably otherwise would be really hard to tell to them through normal and traditional media. So now that I have this new interactive format, uh, of course I've been looking for stories that could benefit from storytelling in this way. 
uh, a new kind of storytelling to, to highlight important stories. And sometime last year I heard about a fantastic location that would be perfect for this format. Uh, the world's largest cave, uh, which is in Viet Vietnam, and it's called Son Dong. I realized making an interactive piece from this cave would look, would look stunning. It would be fantastic. Because the images from this, coming from this place was absolutely stellar. And another fun fact, uh, or amazing fact, is that the cave wasn't fully explored until 2009. Which means only a handful of people have ever set foot in this cave since they found it. And that even that just adds even more <laughs> to the fact that I wanted to go there. And uh, but there wasn't really a, there, 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 there was a the location, but there wasn't really a story. There was nothing from there was no uh, immediate need for me to go there. There was no story really. It was a fantastic location. Uh, but then the story came all of a sudden in uh, I think it was sometime September or November, somewhere between there, when we were suddenly hit by the news that. Uh, a tourism company wants to build a cable car system through this cave. And from that point I realized if I want to do this reportage, we have to do it now. This was, uh, <laughs> this was not so many months ago. Uh, so immediately after that we realized we have to just, me and my team, we have to sc scramble and really get this done. Because if we don't do it now, this cave might be destroyed in the future and it would be impossible to make the reportage. So now we had a deadline. We have to go to the cave really really soon to be able to go there before this possible construction would take place. Uh, I immediately contacted my colleagues at National Geographic to propose to them that we could mount an expedition to the cave to capture it. And this was important for two, th for two reasons. First of all that if the construction happens we have to do this uh, documentation before that. And if it happens, we also want to have the copy in terms of the interactive reportage so that people can look at it even if the cave is destroyed in some way. So uh, luckily National Geographic said yes in just two weeks time. So we had an expedition going. But as you know, it costs a lot of money and we needed huge amounts of equipment to be able to do this. So we also had to get other sponsors on board. And the most important ones that were also able to say yes really quick were Dell and Intel. And after that point, we knew that we can do this. We can do an expedition to uh, the world's largest cave. But we had to go in January. This was a some, somewhere uh, September, October. Uh, so we, we had to mount this uh, in just a few months' time. And Christmas was uh, coming in between. And uh, we had to plan everything from equipment to the whole expedition from A to B. Uh, so we had to start planning. So now we had this momentous challenge ahead of us. How were we going to go to the world's largest cave, take 360 degree images and come out with enough material to make an interactive reportage? Uh, first, of course, I had to choose a good team and I chose seven of my best colleagues and friends that I know I could trust in the field. And that, that became my core photography team, the core team that were gonna help me produce this piece. And we also needed a lot of help in Vietnam, of course, with all the expedition lo logistics, all the everyday stuff that you don't have time for when you do a, a photo expedition. So we were able to hire a, a team of uh, cave experts that work within this region in Vietnam that were going to help us when we came there. And as for the equipment, the first huge challenge was the lighting. How were we going to be able to light this cave? Looking at the statistics, looking at the images, we saw these huge caverns which we know were dark. Because, of course, there had been some photographers there, so we had some reference images to work with. But how are we going to light up a huge place like this world's largest cave? And not only did we need enough light, we needed to have a really portable solution. Because this is a really tough terrain walking around inside the cave. So we needed to be able to have really small solutions that output a real... Uh, huge amount of light and that was a challenge but we found a small company in the Netherlands that make fantastic high power LED lights which are powered by small batteries can, that can be easily recharged. So we got three of those lights and about 16 kilos of batteries that we were going to have to get into Vietnam but we hoped that with, with these three lights we were going to have enough light to actually light those huge caverns. There was no way of knowing of course, I mean, it could turn out that we came there and it w wasn't enough, but we just had to trust that they would be. 
Then of course communication within the cave would be extremely important because this is a almost five kilometer long cave where me and my team were going to be spread out and we have to communicate well. So we have to bring radios and make sure that they were going to be enough to talk to each other even if we were spread out by kilometers in the cave. And another really important part were to bring computers, really good performance laptops into the cave because when I work with the 360 uh, photography we have to render the images to be able to see how they turn out. That means compared to taking a still photograph or a video we can't just look in the camera on the display to see uh, what we got. We have to sit down by a computer, render the image to actually see how it turned out. So we needed to be able to have computers every night, sit down after a full work day on the expedition to render the images and see, see, see how they looked. And that was a huge challenge to bring enough batteries and uh, enough computer power and performance to, to do this in, a, in an efficient way. So after several weeks of planning for all the equipment, making sure we had enough gear to make this expedition physically possible, of course we had to budget and plan for time. Uh, we had to make a really, really specific plan of where to do where and when. Uh, of course, the best case scenario uh, is that the expedition was a huge success. We had the perfect weather and all the conditions, but we also have to plan for the really bad scenarios or the worst case scenarios. What happens if it's raining for several days and we can't capture the images we want? We have to make a really tight time planning to make sure that we have the core of the reportage no matter what. So that we know which locations are absolutely essential, which do we have to capture, they are the bare minimum, and uh, how can we budget the time on top of that. Because if we don't get those parts, the reportage, we won't be able to make the reportage. So we made a really tight uh, time planning sheet where we basically put down all the locations we were going to cover to make sure if we don't have enough time over here, then we have to move that over there on the second day and go back and yeah, really specific planning that way. So we were able to make sure that no matter what happens, we will come out of the cave with enough material to tell the story. So finally, we were getting ready to go. The, I remember the last pieces of equipment, uh, some of the batteries and everything arrived in just a few days before the expedition. But we, we felt ready to go. We had the, the planning nailed down and we were getting ready for the next phase, which, which was to actually go and do the expedition, the hard part. Uh, we had even checked that uh, all the this massive amounts of uh, equipment that we were able to bring them on the airlines. Because it is a problem when you're, when you're flying with uh, backpacks and cases full of photographic equipment, especially batteries. Uh, it can be problematic when you're flying and some airlines don't, uh, don't want you to bring certain types of batteries. And I had made sure that we checked all the battery types, all the equipment types and had the appropriate permits for everything to make sure that we were able to bring especially the lithium bar batteries for the, li for the lights. Those were the most critical batteries to bring, of course. But it was okay. In according to international flight laws, it was okay to bring these batteries. So it felt like we were getting ready to go. The bags were packed. And then <laughs> I remember the night before, uh, I was just browsing online, looking one extra time about the battery thing to make sure we were able to bring them. And it turned out that the specific airline we were traveling with had extra restrictions on lithium batteries. These were not in accordance with international rules that we had looked at, but these were added guidelines. So we were actually not able to bring these lithium batteries on this specific airline that we were traveling with tomorrow. And I remember just my, the icy feeling going up my spine, realizing we might not be able to bring these batteries. But I decided that this was too late to, to try to change this. So I just, uh, we, we had the international rules printed to be able to show in the flight security checks. And I decided not to tell anyone in the team uh, because this was just too much. We were too stressed out with too many factors to be stressed about. So I just didn't tell anyone. And we, we took the first flight and I was just hoping that no one at this airline would care. And um, yeah, let's uh, just board a plane and uh, see if this works out. So the next morning we go to Stockholm Orlando Airport and since I didn't tell anyone in the team about this battery problem, I'm the only one being nervous about getting our baggage through to Vietnam. But we check the stuff in at uh, Orlando and it goes through security and it seems to be fine. I start to think maybe we'll get these batteries to Vietnam after all. 
And we go to Frankfurt, it seems to be fine. We come to Ho Chi Minh City and it seems to be fine. So I'm starting to sigh of relief that uh, maybe, maybe we can, we can get through with all the stuff to the cave. But we have one short flight left to Dong Hoi in Vietnam. And as we go through security, the last security we, we're passing on this long haul flight, the security guard starts pointing to our bags and saying, no, 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 and that we can't get them through. And I feel that now they're gonna take the batteries. But he starts just taking out our tripods out of the bags. Our tripods? I've never even thought about the fact that they would take our tripods. Why would they take, why, why would they take our tripods? But he says, no way these are flying in, on this flight to Dong Hoi. He's, he, we involve several of the security guards trying to show our permits and everything. We need these tripods to be able to work and we have a permit for this. But he just simply says no. So now we're standing almost at the end of our trip. We've gotten the batteries through, but suddenly they want to take all of our tripods, making the expedition impossible. So what do we do now? In the next episode, Martin arrives in Vietnam to meet up with the expedition team. But will he be able to bring his tripods? Be sure not to miss the next episode when the trekking towards the world's largest cave begins. <laughs>